Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, our listeners. Thanks to everyone, including Pele Glendale, Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, and everyone welcome our new patron, Naranjan. Yay! Yay. Awesome. On this episode of DTNS, it's the first Kindle with color. Who wants to buy one? Plus, do data caps harm consumers? And if they do, why are they still around? Scott Johnson also tells us what to expect from the latest strike negotiations around if and when game studios can replicate voice actors. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 16th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Here in Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We've got a great show for you. We're going to talk more about those new Kindles. Uh, quite a big quite a big lineup uh, from Amazon. But first, as we always do, let's start with the quick hits. YouTube announced content credentials built on the C2PA standard to help users know whether videos were captured by a camera or altered using an AI tool. The new feature will attach tamper-resistant, hopefully, metadata to content in an effort to be transparent about where it came from and modification history. The move is part of Google's broader effort to combat misinformation and build trust around its own tools. The social media platform X will not be regulated under the European Union's Digital Markets Act. Although X met the user threshold, it didn't qualify as a gatekeeper, meaning it avoids the stricter regulations that Google and Meta have to honor. This gives X more operational freedom, avoiding obligations like making messaging service interoperable or offering users greater control over pre-installed software. Global chip stocks lost $420 billion in value after semiconductor manufacturer ASML announced a disappointing sales forecast. This triggered a decline in shares of major chip makers like NVIDIA and Taiwan Semiconductor, with ASML itself having its largest one-day market cap drop since way back in 1998. The slump is based on weakening demand outside of AI applications. Those are still in high demand. Reduce spending by key, key clients doing other stuff like Intel, for example, raising concerns about, OK, broader market trends, despite that strong AI demand. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission has finalized a click the cancel rule requiring companies to make it easy to cancel subscriptions as it is to sign up for them. This rule is part of the Time is Money initiative and is designed to eliminate excessive paperwork or long hold times that prevent customers from canceling quickly. It also addresses broader issues, including deceptive practices like fake reviews and customer service doom loops. Doom loops. Uh, well, I've been in those. <laughs> Didn't know there was a name for a doom loop, but yes, I know exactly what that means. <laughs> Amazon announced it will invest more than $500 million in the development of small modular nucle nuclear reactors, or SMRs, to meet its energy needs and support the national grid. Partnering with utilities in Washington and Virginia, Amazon's goal is to power data centers and local businesses with SMRs that will collectively produce more than 60 megawatts of carbon-free energy. This move is part of Amazon's goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions, which may happen someday. All right, let's talk about those Kindles. Uh, Amazon announced uh, quite quite a bit of stuff here on Wednesday as we're recording this, starting with its first ever color e-reader called the Kindle Color Soft. Has a 6.8 inch color e-ink display. Has a design much like the Paperwhite, if you're familiar with that. Starts at $200 for the ad supported model in the US with 16 gigs of storage and ships October 30th. Now, when I first saw this, I was like, finally, color e-ink. But then I was like, do I, how much do I care about this? <laughs> because I don't know if you have a book with illustrations or a graphic novel, that kind of thing. Mm. Sure, this would, this would make a huge difference. But I do think there's something to at least being able to see a book cover, you know, as it was intended 
as sure. the dead tree option. Some books too also have lots of illustrations in the middle, and you know, there's there's other reasons why uh, certain books anyway would yeah. benefit from this. But as a comic book reader, a fairly avid comic book reader, I use a uh, an iPad Pro to read most of my comics, and I'm doing it most of that through Comicsology, which Amazon now owns and is part of the Kindle library or ecosystem. Um, mm-hmm. Reading those on a regular paperwhite Kindle is a nightmare. They're terrible. And I don't recommend it. Um, however, this looks like if they can replicate at least the vibrancy of the colors, this could be neat. Now, based on screenshots, it seems like it's close. And I'd have to hear some reviews to say otherwise. But uh, this is interesting from that standpoint. If you're a comic book reader and you use comicolo- Comicsology, you're in the ecosystem already. Maybe finally you have a better way to read comics uh, instead of having to use an alternate device. I mean, it's it's not just comics because I mean, the, there's another publication that a lot of people still find, and you can find it in your grocer's aisle as you're checking out uh, magazines. Right? Magazines are one of the f- big reasons why we have a lot of uh, photojournalism. People want to see pictures of things, and when you see pictures, you often want to see them more true to life. So black and white's great, but when we shifted to color, that really sold uh, magazines and having. Whether it's like an interview with a celebrity or, or or another, you know, a politician or a famous individual, they add something to it. They add sort of a, a charisma to everything. And I think this is, I mean, this is one of the holy grails of of e readers was to get color at an affordable price range. Right before, when they developed the technology, it was either really slow or very expensive, or actually it was both. Uh, when they got the speed issue down, you still came out with a twelve hundred dollar display which really didn't work for most people because, like Scott, people would just shrug their shoulders and just buy a tablet instead. Sure. Uh, but for, for, what they're, for what they're charging, this is – I am very excited to, to read the reviews for this uh, when they come out. I'm not a comic book reader. I'm, um, I, I do read magazines, so I could see the point there. But the thought was, but I can just as easily read a magazine on an iPad or, you know, or a, you know, a Samsung you know, device or something like that. But, Scott, when you said comic books, I'm like, oh, okay. And then I saw the price. This thing's only, it starts at 200 bucks. Yeah. So it's, it's less than half the price of, like, an iPad mini. Yeah. So yeah. For, for that standpoint, if it actually looks good enough, and because of how much it's costing, I, you know, I, I would just imagine that it's still a Kindle. So this, you know, the utilitarian nature of using a Kindle to read as compared to using a tablet that weighs three or four times as much yeah. is probably a cool it's, way to, con- you know, consume And then there, there's also the battery life. I mean, battery that, life. that just, you know, e-readers just to have, I mean, e- e-readers? that battery life will last. I, you know, the, the <laughs> color options, maybe not so much, but yeah. this is a difference between charging something once a day or your, you know, SOL or, you know, waiting a couple of weeks to even that, think about that. Too. The, only, the, the real question I have is like one of the advantages of comics on a tablet is pinch and zoom when you want to look at some detail or maybe your eyes stink and you need a better look at the text or something uh, or guided view, which these comics support. I don't know that these are supporting that, and I don't know what the refresh rate looks like. Can I pinch and zoom? Well, like, I, the, I have questions. I just this don't know is what what's great. Are. It's an e-ink reader. You don't have those issues that – Having bounced between an e- the old the original ki- Kindle, even uh, the paper white, and just a tablet, it's noticeably easier in my eyes. I can read it for longer stretches without having to, you know, turn away and look at something else because uh, uh, a, a tablet's an emissive display, like an LCD monitor or HD TV. It's constantly shooting. Uh, 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 photons at your eyeballs. E-readers rely on reflective light, so light that hits it and bounces off it, much like a piece of paper or uh, you find in a book. And I find, at least for personally, I find I can read for longer stretches. Yeah, um, no, I, I don't. I don't disagree there. I think the eye strain is going to be better. My point is that the point this, this pinch and zoom has nothing to do with strain. It has everything to do with I want to zoom in and see the art closer i want to get a better look at this text because my eyes are just old and i can't see it's not an adjustable font you know these are basically images i'm looking at so i just i want that stuff to be in there if it's not in there we'll deal with it but uh we'll see what the reviews say (laughs) yeah and this is why i thought this was a great conversation especially today scott because you uh, you know the you know illustrations and art is a big part of why you're reading stuff mm-hmm. i mean i can't think of the last graphic novel i read um you know actually there is one behind me i i'm supposed to read <laughs> you know, my friend is like why are you reading that it's so good yeah. but um but but normally i'm just like eh, i don't know it's black text on a white screen 
Is it yeah. that big a deal? But I think once you get to the color um, situation, then, you know, everything that's like black and white is like the Wizard of Oz, right? yeah. where you're yeah. like, no, it's better in color. It's better yeah. in color. Yeah. No, I hope it does well for him. And like like Rob said, the price is really good. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how it goes. Well, Amazon gave us a couple other announcements. Uh, new Kindle Paperwhite has a brighter screen, faster page turning, comes with dark mode, doesn't have the warm light feature, um, which is uh, something I think that you were alluding to earlier, Roger, uh, that, that lets your eyes uh, feel a little bit better when reading for longer periods of time. In the U.S., the base model goes for $140 with ads, again, 16 gigs of storage, an ad-free version is $160, and then there's a signature edition for $200 with 32 gigs of storage with optional wireless charging and an auto adjusting front light. Then we have the latest Kindle Scribe. That's Amazon's kind of high end e-reader, um, but also a note taking device. I would, I would compare it m very much to the more remarkable two, which is uh, what I have. Um, there are others. Kobo makes one as well. 10.2 inch display, 300 PPI resolution, starting at $340 for the base model, includes a stylus for jotting down notes directly on the screen and ships December 4th. Nice. Um, how's so the yeah, we're, we're getting into holiday season <laughs> yeah. stuff. The, yeah, the, the, yeah, go ahead, Rob. The Kindle Scribe is the one that interests me. I was playing with a friend's Remarkable 2 and almost had an accident with my credit card on the Remarkable website. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, because I, I really don't take a lot of notes on paper. I do everything digitally. So this could really come in, you know, you know, come in handy because it looks like it's a little less expensive than the Remarkable 2. Yeah, I, I my interest in the in the remarkable too, as well as any other kind of e paper note taking device, is actually pretty high. I kind of really want one, but what keeps happening is everybody says, "Well, the latency, the latency, the latency. It's not as good as it used to be," um, and I usually don't find out how good it is or how bad it is until reviews hit. So this is another device we're gonna have to do a little wait and see on. Um, people seem generally pleased with the scribe, the first scribe. Uh, a larger format scribe is interesting, right? Because you're just going to have more room to work, and that's more like the Remarkable 2. Um, yeah, if they come back with, hey, the stylus and this latency is awesome, they may have uh, that may be the Kindle I get next and not even bother with the color. That could be a, a good live with it um, uh, episode at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, like Lights how do, you know, the scribes, the Kobos, the Remarkables compare with each other? Because yeah. I don't think the Remarkable has latency issues at all mm. but i also very rarely you know pick up you know the pen and jot things down i just it's just not something that i do in my day-to-day -day life sure yeah so folks let's change gears and talk about my favorite thing data caps the federal <laughs> communications commission on tuesday approved a notice of inquiry to examine whether data caps harm consumers in competition the fcc is also looking to why data caps still persist despite increased broadband needs and the technical ability to offer unlimited data plans now i've got to be honest i've never really understood technically why data caps exist i mean i understand why broadband companies implement them they ultimately can charge people more to have more data but it's like there is a you know they act like there's a finite amount of bits that gets used up and that's just not how this stuff works. The FCC chair, Jessica Rosenworcel has also expressed concern about data caps in a press release. She said for most people in the United States, rationing their internet usage would be unthinkable and impractical. Restricting consumers data can cut off small businesses from their customers, slap fees on low income families and prevent people with disabilities from using the tools that they rely on to communicate. So. So, so what do you guys think? Are you, are, are you, are, are you, are you, are you good with the FCC deciding to look at data caps and see whether or not they are a good thing for us or not? Yeah, they've been doing this for like 20 years. <laughs> yes, I'm great with it. And I would like, I, I would like the FCC to say, do not give people data caps that make no sense. Um, the, you know, the telcos argument has always been, well, but, you know, just a very small percentage of all of our customers are using most of the bandwidth. And it's like, OK, but but that's what? that's Does a that logical hurt you? fallacy. Right. There's it's, there's it's not like there's a finite amount of data. 
they, they treat it like it's milk. If you buy a gallon of milk and you drink 128 ounces, you no longer have milk. But when it comes to data, it's more like a billion gallons of milk flowing through a pipe and they give you a straw to suck a little bit at a time. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, well, w- once you get to, uh, you know, once you get to a gallon, we've got to charge you more. And that, and that technically makes no sense. It's just that I think a lot of people did, don't necessarily understand how yeah, data it, it works. it kind of turns into like, well, you, the customer, are being greedy. Because but it's it, like, but does that change you, the company, yeah, at well, all? Well, that, that's what they're doing. They are taking advantage of our inability to understand how data works. And Rob, I think Rob is 100% correct. It's never been the way they want us to think it is. And all they really can control is how much of that, inf- or how much of that pipe we get at any given time, not the uh, supposed amount of data that somehow we can get or use, or there's some kind of, like you said, finite amount that everybody has to share. It doesn't work that way. So letting some people be on all the time, streaming all the time, doing two 4K streams at once, whatever they're doing to consume their data, and somebody else checking their mail every three hours, and both of them are paying the same amount, this is just corporate greed. I don't care what you want to call it. Like there's, there's It's silly to say that you are using more than somebody else, therefore you should pay more. You're not using anything. Right, you're right, just on because there. the implication there yeah. is you're taking the bandwidth away from someone else who's paying the same as you, but that person is not doing that. Correct. Now, if they were to charge for the size of your pipe, for example, you pay one price if you get a coffee stir type straw, you pay another price if you get a straw to drink out, of, you know, to drink a Coke from McDonald's, or you get a fire hose, um, then they can charge differently for those. But here's the thing. They do charge differently for those. They do that, too. So right. the, the data caps, they, they, they make no logical sense because, once again, data is not a finite thing. It's like you can you can only get it at a certain speed that you pay for, but you should be able to just continually get it forever. Um, I do understand that the more people that are pulling data simultaneously – um, that it, you know, the, the experience could, you know, get worse because it's just congested at that point. But that is when they have to look at, well, if you we have a lot of people who have a hundred megabytes versus a lot of people who have a thousand megabytes or whatever the maximum you can now get, then they, they just need to make the determination on what do we charge for that and up the, upgrade their equipment so that they can actually facilitate that. Once again, like I said, you know, it's not like milk. You don't buy a gallon, drink the gallon, then the gallon is gone. You're buying data, which is always there. And it's just determinative how often or how fast can you get the data via the pipe that you actually are getting? Exactly. The straw machine. comparison The straw comparison is perfect because yeah. that is exactly it. How, how big is your pipe? So how much milk can you get in there at a time? The milk is infinite. We have, yeah. in this c- scenario, we have an infinite amount of milk somewhere that I, we're piping into. I will add, <laughs> it makes perfect sense if you're trying to make money off the service, right? If you're the provider... Yeah, there's no technical reason why yeah. it should be done this way, but for the fiduciary benefit of the shareholders and the guy and the, and the people in the C-suite, yeah, if if you can, if you can, I mean, that's the whole point of uh, of, of free uh, free market economics, is right? You you push as much as the market will bear until it pushes back and they say no, or you get a competitor, like I have. You know where I live, where it says like, yeah, maybe not so, maybe not such a good idea. We'll have that option if that ever comes to it. But for right now, it's a free for all. Yeah, the ghost of Tom. If Tom was here, he would be. He would be saying that. He would be and saying, like, <laughs> "Will Tom is still alive?" He, he, he will say. He will say, "We will pay it as long as we're willing to pay it." Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just the truth. I, it, I, this I mean, less... it it has, I think, gotten better over the years. I currently have Spectrum um, internet. I don't pay for cable, so everything and you know everything I watch on TV is all is all um, through my internet subscription. It used to be, and this is you know I'm calling out Comcast, but I know uh, other providers did this as well. Like at the end of the month, you know, from like the 26th through the 31st things started to get weird because I was getting throttled horribly for an unlimited subscription. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, yeah man, yeah. that used it, to make it, me so mad. I hate it. Yeah. We should say that the FCC first started inviting customers to comment on broadband data last June, hundreds of which you can now read on their website and you can still go and do this. I actually took a look at them. Um, most of the comments that I saw are like, no, we hate data caps. The few that actually are pro data caps look and feel like they were written by lobbyists from the broadband industry. So you have to take those, those ones that are pro data caps with a grain of salt, 
but hopefully these things will go away relatively soon. Sarah, as you said, they've been talking about this stuff for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, let, let's let's do something because they don't make any sense anymore. They never. I wonder really made how, sense, how many times the now. same lobbyist just put it into Chat GPT and was like, and then rephrase, and then rephrase, <laughs> and then rephrase. Maybe <laughs> you know, it's finally coming together like, for ooh, those guys. We yeah. got ten comments here. Ooh, people are real fired up. <laughs> Uh, well, you might be fired up about this, um, this, this, uh, this, the conversation or anything that we talk about on the show, and we would love to know more about it. One way to let us know is in our subreddit. It's a fun crew of folks. Submit stories and vote on them at reddit.com slash r slash daily tech news show. Next Wednesday, October 23rd, SAG-AFTRA... Uh, a union will re-enter negotiations with a bargaining group representing AAA game developers such as EA, Take Two, and Insomniac Games. Members of the union have been on strike since late July, so everybody wants to get to a resolution, but we're not there yet. The main contention is the use of generative AI, which could be used to replicate voice actors by game studios, and a lot of voice actors are very, very not into that. So, Scott. The strike has been going on for a while now. Why is there not a deal yet? Well, it's mostly about the the generative AI thing. It's a big hang up for these guys, and I don't blame them. Um, just for you know full disclosure, I have a couple of very close friends that work in the games industry as voice actors. Um, they do other stuff too, but they're part of this guild and they're part of this lawsuit. Um, their main contention is they should always, one hundred percent of the time, be in control of where their voice gets used and when it gets used, they're the ones that get paid. That's what they want. Now that may end up being some form of perpetuity based uh, contract where somebody, let's just call him Larry says, well, you can have my voice for this character in perpetuity, but that costs this much <laughs> and it's a lot. Um, and every five years I get to renegotiate it depending on my position in the market or whatever. Um, if you want me just for your one game, we negotiate that like a traditional game. We do the one-off and we're done. If you have a sequel, you come back to me and we talk about it. We negotiate a deal. But you can't then, after our deal is done, we've done our single game deal or our, or our triple game deal, whatever, uh, take the content that I created for you, train that on an AI, and then use that in any way. That includes going back to the old games or let's say remastering one of those games in eight years. Um, most of the time what you have to do in the past is you go to the voice actor and say, hey, we're making a new version of this game. Um, we're redoing all the graphics, and it turns out we need some additional voice lines. Are you willing to do it? That's the, the, because the old the, way. Because the original contract was just for that first Correct. game. Correct. So yeah. you contract for additional work, no problem. Yeah. In this scenario, what they really want to do on the dev side, they really, really want to do is to have paid you for your game work the time you did it eight years ago. And then they want to launch forward to this time they do a remaster where they you know, get to basically double sell their game. And they want to be able to train your voice in a generative, a, a generative AI model and then use you again. Um, and they want to do that without having to pay you again because they already paid you once. Why would they pay you again is their thinking. Um, what they want in the, in the guild is to ensure through these negotiations and through ultimately a deal that that doesn't happen, that you can't do that, uh, that you would have to work with them to get it. And if you do, you, you'd still have the power to say, well, I'll lend you my voice for your AI based generative thing, but you're going to have to pay me this much every time you use it or this one fee for using it at all or whatever, but they need to be in charge of where the voice gets used. To me, it makes perfect sense. I don't think you have to be even biased you'd have to be a, uh, the owner of a dev company that doesn't want to pay voice actors anymore to see a problem with this this just makes sense to me whether it's your likeness your sound your creation your content whatever um you know the big beef across the board with generative ai whether it's art or sound music whatever is the same beef we made the work and you're not paying for it now right and that's unfair and, well, and, and I, that's and, all they're aiming for here is some and fairness. in music i mean this has been going on for uh, you know since the dawn of man right it's like mm -hmm. that song sounds a little too much like my song right and then you know you have to go to court and figure out if the song was you know if, is it coincidental or, you know or did you know did they rip you off i think with generative ai uh, a lot of actors are worried that you're going to make something that sounds like me if I don't agree to do this. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. then everyone's just going to like it because they wanted to hear my voice, but I don't get anything out of this. And yeah. then you're just going to say, no, it wasn't you. Yeah. The other, the other issue is this, you know, let's say, let's take a game like, oh gosh, I don't know. Let's take World of Warcraft, a game I play a lot. Um, let's say you had a voice work done for a, for a raid uh, encounter and all the work is done. It's been done. It's actually out in the wild. But the developers learn after some time, oh, shoot, we have this whole extra thing we need to put in there. And it's going to require about a paragraph of text read by this guy. In the old way, you would hire the guy. You'd go through the rigmarole, fly him out, do the thing. It's expensive. It's time consuming. The yeah. devs would love not to do that. They would love to say, it's just a paragraph. We want to just use your voice for this little bit, poop it out in literally seconds, and no one has to fly anywhere. That makes sense from the dev's point of view. I understand the pipeline compression that creates. It's kind of amazing, potentially, right? But as it turns out, in a civil society, we shouldn't be just taking other people's things willy-nilly and using them without mm. their permission. So I, I, I understand the desire for the industry to jump on board with this technology, but I, I think it's important that these guys strike a deal so that they're in control of their likenesses and their voice likenesses so that this doesn't get out of hand and get weird. Um, so that's what they're holding out for. I hope they get it. I mean, this is only a very limited number of, of developers coming to the table so far. There's a lot more out there that need to be a part of this. So this will probably set the standard for whatever happens next. Scott, how far do you think we are away from when they just don't need voice actors at all? They can generate a unique voice from AI and just type in, this is what I want you to sound like, this is the emotion that I want you to have, and they just make up their own voices. How, how well, far are we away from that? We're pretty close to it now. The problem with it is now is that people are very critical of this, and if they hear about it or know about it, you risk your game getting trashed and not purchased. People are very, very sensitive on this subject. Players are, I should say. Um, it's not universal, but that's generally how it is. There's a negative connotation to it. So I don't think you're going to see... I, I think the deals are required for people to be okay with the technology being used. If they know that it was okay to re-record uh, Illidan's voice in World of Warcraft using Liam O'Brien's blessing on an AI version of his voice, that will make players go, oh, well, okay, then he's... You know, if he was in on it, I'm I'm cool with it. But if it's not, people will turn on these devs. Well, and so. how do you how do you tell the world that? You well, know, then the, it turns yeah. into you know sort of a PR nightmare or or potential nightmare, right? Of like, no, 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 everybody's on board. You know, the actor has to like put something on Instagram saying I'm good with this. You know, <laughs> everybody go forth, all good. Well, in it theory, does. in theory, the develop the developers. Or the technology is in a place now where you shouldn't even be able to notice the difference. And so unless you're really paying attention, and there will be some people who do, but most people will just hear it and go, oh, that's Liam again. Cool. I'm good. And they just don't think about it. Like, it just is natural and it's fine. That's the reason it's creepy if they don't involve Liam. Right. Because they can makes, do that right now. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking of uh, James Earl Jones. He before he before he passed, you know, year so, year and a half or so before he passed away, he actually you know say, you go use all my recordings of me de being Darth Vader, so Darth Vader doesn't die with me, or you've right. got to use someone's voice who's trying to fake a voice like mine. Just right. continue to use mine. So, yeah, I can see you know I can see both sides of this, but yeah, I, I definitely want the voice actors to get paid. Yeah, and his and his foundation, or not his foundation, his family will receive. Uh, royalties based on that usage that's part of his contract and mm. uh, that's all they're really asking for is those kinds of contracts like let us let us have a chance at this before you guys just gonna go run really nilly because it's not clear in existing contracts whether or not the devs can or should use that content and that's what they want to fight so I, I'm, I'm clearly a little biased in this position but i i just don't i just think the argument on the other side is is a selfish one so i i hope they went out Scott, how many games uh, do you think, you know, people really, really care about the human behind the voice that is, you know, voicing various things? Well, there's so many indie games that still don't do voice work. There are plenty of examples of AI voices in games that are clearly AI and it's okay because, oh, it's a ship's robot, so it doesn't need to be a person. Or, right, right. Or whatever, yeah. right? But if they... If we're talking the market that is the front-facing one, the AAA market, the market where you're buying these games off the shelf at Walmart, they're selling millions of copies. Um, we're talking hundreds of games a year, really. Uh, I don't think that's an overestimation. Uh, at the very least, you're talking bi a big 50. And that's every year. 
And those are people where they're hiring like Hollywood actors to do a lot of that stuff. They're not just hiring voice actors who do anime or whatever. So it, it, they really do need a good overarching kind of cover everybody if they can kind of deal with this because it is everything from one guy's little indie project in his garage all the way up to a 300 person multi-million dollar production and and they and they want they want coverage on all of it and i think they deserve it yeah it's a, it's a good conversation it's got glad for you you know for you bringing it up why don't you tell folks what you've got going on, where they can get at you these days. Well, sure. Uh, Thursdays, I do a show called Core. It's all about gaming. And we talk about these kinds of subjects on that show all the time, me and my co-host, along uh, with many other things. We also have a really good time doing it. So if you are thinking about trying to get your ears uh, plugged up with a great new <laughs> video game podcast that isn't even that new, <laughs> but feels new every week, uh, check it out on Thursdays. It's live, and it's also uh, via podcast, YouTube, all that stuff. Check it out at frogpants.com slash core. I love that idea. Plugged up. <laughs> plugged in, you know? Yep. Plugged Whatever. In, plugged yeah. Up. Just listen. Sure. Uh, patrons, we love you. And you can stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're talking about some gaming stuff, but this one's different. We'll discuss a retro gaming console maker's attempt at an N64 game console that can play N64 games, but at 4K. Whoa. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. See you tomorrow. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)